windswept hills and downs of England stand our earliest surviving buildings, such as Stonehenge, a temple whose gods are forgotten, but whose stones still stand where men dragged them thousands of years ago. From such stones, builders hewed the places of Christian worship, now the glory of England's architectural past. Limited as to mechanical means, the builders labored to create beauty from this simple element of the earth. And their adventures in building grew as they added to their store of hard-won knowledge. From the massive strength and power of the invading Norman architecture, with its rounded arches and mighty pillars climbing to bold heights, the English masons created a truly English style of building. A style that somehow caught the light and shade, the spiritual aspiration and the strength of this craftsman's England. carried slender pillars higher and higher. They used the pointed arch to build boldly and with beauty. They allowed more space for windows, lighting the churches and making possible the use of beautiful stained glass. They evolved the exclusively English fan vaulting, bridging great spaces with delicate tracery. The outward thrusts and stresses of the new soaring heights and weights they learned to take with buttresses or to throw onto the outside walls with flying buttresses. The cathedrals of England stand a lasting and lovely monument to that cooperative alliance of building trades, the work of whose nameless craftsman is so marked with strict honesty of building expression, intrinsic loveliness of structure, bold constructional experiment and advance, making this a building epoch still unequaled as a record of human endeavor and achievement. The gradual development of house building can still be seen clearly outlined on many an English cottage. Timber, at first the only material, soon became just the framework, the walls being made of the local building materials. The timber grew more and more decorative, each corner of England finding its own distinctive style. Yet these homes never lose the look of having grown out of the surrounding countryside, as indeed they have. In design, the rich Tudor houses had much in common with church architecture. Builders made no startling innovations, but where local stone was scarce or unsuitable, they did use brick extensively 
especially in the clay districts of the south. The craftsmen of the guilds lavished their skill on the profuse and detailed decoration of the outsides of Elizabethan houses, achieving an amazing richness of design in stone, iron and wood. Reviving interest in classical architecture abroad begins to find reflection in England. This new wave of stylistic invasion being closely associated with the work of Inigo Jones and Christopher Wren. As with the Norman invasion, English builders began to adapt the new ideas and forms to English climate and needs. Inigo Jones himself used Portland stone with great effect, but it was Christopher Wren who took over the classical designs and made them serve an essentially English style by making a new and refreshing use of such English building materials as red brick, Portland stone and slate, influencing British architecture for many years. The chief feature of building in the 18th century was the spacious dwellings designed for the landowning aristocracy with their amazingly rich interior decoration, carrying out the dictum that a true architectural work is a building duly provided with all necessary furniture, decorated with all due ornament according to the use, quality and dignity of the building, from mere mouldings or abstract lines to the great epical work of sculpture and painting. Another feature of building at this time was the moulding of the adjoining countryside to provide a perfect landscape setting for the buildings. The sense of proportion which marks these great country houses can also be seen displayed in the layout and building of the town of Bath, the noblest domestic architecture in England, springing from the beds of pale buff limestone of the Cotswolds. Pleasing too is the Georgian house, marked by simplicity of design and perfect proportioning. The quickening spiritual impulse that inspired past triumphs died away. No new materials or methods of note were evolved, save perhaps the lovely Regency buildings of John Nash and his school. Of Nash it was said that he found London all brick and left it all plaster. Fresh impetus came to architecture from industry, from the builders of the railways, the bridges and the factory. It was engineers who conceived the idea of using great ropes of iron to support spans greater than could ever have been built of stone. It was a greenhouse designer who pointed the way to building in glass and iron. It was a bit ahead of its time, for it was strongly urged on architects then that the only style proper for modern northern work is the northern Gothic of the 13th century. In this style, let us build the church, 
the palace and the cottage, but chiefly let us use it for civil and domestic buildings. From Gothic, architects turned to Grecian. But it was the introduction of steel-framed buildings that enabled architecture to take a big stride forward. Newest material of all is reinforced concrete. Concrete had been known for centuries, but it cracked under strain. Nowadays, made with a core of metal rods, it is one of the strongest building materials on earth and is used in new and exciting ways. The present day massing of people in big cities demands large scale building. With steel and concrete and glass, architects are designing to catch something that has lain forgotten for years, sun and light and air. There is room to breathe, room to move. There is strength in building and design suited to building materials. Britain's moist, changeable climate makes severe demands on building materials, so many of our newest buildings are in brick. For brick is a great humanizer of buildings, whether they be for living in, for recreation, or for industrial purposes. With a wider selection of materials than ever before, with greater facilities for building, with the inspiration and help of past architectural glories, and with the accumulated knowledge of 19 centuries, the architect of today may yet begin an epoch of building triumphs worthy of England's glorious heritage.